Christianity that says, with Christ, I'm okay. <laughs> with Christ. So, casting our cares upon him. Thank you for that song. Second Samuel chapter number 7 today. I'd like to invite you to stand as we prepare to read the word of God. Second Samuel chapter number 7. I want to read verses 1 through 5. I'm really going to stop kind of in the middle of number 5. I think, I, if I remember right, I think I'm going to read all of verse number 5 later on in the message. So please try to avoid the temptation to um, disobey me and read farther than I instruct. All right? We'll get there. I'm pretty sure we'll get there. So, But I do want to kind of stop on purpose where I'm going to stop. So, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And curtains being, you know, the walls of a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David. Go and tell my servant David. Father, I want to ask you now that you will bless as we begin the message today, Lord God. I ask you, Father, that you'd give us insight and help in the Word of God. And Father, I was just thinking about that song, Cast Thy Care on Me. And I was also thinking this morning in my personal time with you, Lord God, I was thinking about the contrast between the weakness of the flesh and the grace of God, your grace. And, and Heavenly Father, uh, how important it is, really, almost that my weakness be demonstrated so that your grace can be sufficient today. So often, you know, we try to cover our up, make ourselves look good or make ourselves look better than we really are. And sometimes when we do it, we do it, we cover up our weakness to the extent that we cover up your grace. And so, Lord, today I want to ask that your grace would be sufficient. And, um, and Lord God, that this message would be delivered in the grace of God, sufficient grace of God, rather than in any kind of wisdom that, uh, that I might be able to... Um, fame today to pretend to have. Lord God, I pray that you will use the message in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Almost everybody in this room will know that this year my theme for the Sunday morning messages has been based on Acts chapter 9 and verse 6 where, where the Apostle Paul being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And what I'm trying to do this year is, is take us through the Word of God, looking at instructions where God instructs a person what he would have them to do. Uh, Apostle Paul asked the question, God gave him some instructions, but God gave other people instructions on what he'd have them to do, and I think there's something for all, us to learn in all of those. And um, So that's been my, my goal, my focus this this year in my preaching on Sunday mornings. Today we're going to be entering into kind of some new territory in this series on, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And let me just kind of, I look back through some of the notes that are the messages that I've preached uh, so far this year, and I'll just say, you know, God spoke directly to Adam and told him what to do, and God spoke directly to Abraham, told him what to do. God spoke directly to Isaac and told him what to do. God spoke directly to Jacob, told him what to do. God spoke directly to Joseph and told Joseph what to do. God spoke directly to those, um, those Hebrew midwives and told them what to do. God spoke directly to Moses and told him what to do. And God spoke directly to Joshua and told him what to do. And God spoke directly to Samuel, the prophet, and told him what to do. But then things changed in the Word of God. You know, um, 
the world in the days of the Old Testament was no less static than it is in our world today. Uh, our world is constantly shifting and moving, isn't it? And, and things change. And just want to say that um, while this world is uh, not static, neither is God static. Um, God, God never changes. The Bible says he's immutable. He changes not. He, God never changes, but God made his eternal plan before the foundations of the world, and his, and his plan accounts for the shifting sands of this corrupt human nature. So before man's fall, God spoke to Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden, but then after the fall, their relationship, Adam and Eve had an entirely different relationship with God. So it wasn't like God changed, but God did make account for the change in Adam and Eve after their fall. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophet, hath in prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by uh, his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so the Bible clearly says that God speaks at different times in different manners. He uses different methods or different manners to communicate his truth. And uh, so far, and, and, and I think that happens with our text today, we see a shift in how God communicates to man. Previous to this, when God told Adam what to do, he spoke directly to him. And when God told Abraham what to do, he spoke to him directly. And when God told Joseph what to do, he spoke to him directly. And when God told Moses what to do, he spoke to him directly. But it, so far as I can see, God never spoke to King David directly to tell him what to do. That God told David, now God did speak to David, and told him what to do, but God told David what to do through prophets. There were two of them that we know of that God used in David's life. Their names are Nathan and Gad, and especially we see Nathan is the most prominent of the two, uh, of these prophets that God used to direct and to speak to King David. Even a man as great as King David was, and he is no doubt a great man both um, historically and spiritually, uh, he's a great man as far as his leadership skills, his ability in combat. He is a great man. There's no question about it. Uh, he is uh, great in his uh, spiritual nature. I'm a writer of almost all of the Psalms, not all of them, but almost all of the Psalms. He is a great man, but as far as I can see in the Word of God, I, I'm not saying that, I'm, that I know exactly I could be mistaken on this, but as far as I can see, I can't find any place where God spoke directly to David to give him instructions. I think that God may have spoken to David, but to give him instructions is a different, you know, is something different. God used the prophets to give, Nathan, give David instruction. He used especially the prophet Nathan. So I thought I wanted to take just a, a little bit of time today and tell you something about Nathan. And uh, he's going to be kind of the the focus of the, the message today, his name, Nathan, the name means given of God, and he's one of five people in the Bible, um, at least five, one of five people in the Bible who has that name, the name Nathan. So there's Nathan the prophet that we'll be looking at, considering today. Then there is Nathan, who is the son of, of King David and Bathsheba, the brother of Solomon. It's interesting that um, Solomon is the king that God uh, is the man who is chosen to take God's, uh, to take, take King, uh, King David's place, but um, when it comes to the bloodline of the Lord Jesus Christ, his bloodline is through uh, Solomon's brother Nathan. So I think that's interesting too. You've got uh, Joseph and Mary who are both uh, related to King David, but they're related to King David through, um, through different sons of David, and both sons are the children of uh, that Solomon and Nathan, and both of them are the are children of David and Bathsheba. It's a pretty interesting comparison there. But there's Nathan, the son of David and Bathsheba. There's another Nathan, he's, he, um, and he he is the 
the father of a guy may, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you know, you're, you're, you're famous by association, guilt by association, and fame by association. There is a Nathan in the Bible who's the father of Egal, and Egal was one of David's mighty men. So to be the father of a mighty man is a, a matter that God felt like was worth um, uh, recording. Then there is Nathan, who is a chief leader of the, of the people of Israel uh, in the days, or the people of Judah, I should say, in the days of uh, Ezra the ready scribe. And finally, there's another Nathan who is the son of Ittai, and he is also in the tribe of Judah. Um, so you know how sometimes a name, we like sometimes we'll name um, our, our children after either a family member that we love a lot or maybe a, a friend, an important friend, um, name like that. It's like David's relationship with the prophet Nathan was so dear to him that the name Nathan passed down after that in the family of Judah, the tribe of Judah. began. It's like they began to use that name because Nathan, the original Nathan in the Word of God, was so important and was so close to King David so that all along the years, even after David was dead, generations later, they're still naming their children in, in that family line, they're still naming their children Nathan. The, the relationship um, Jesus bore with David um, came to him, as I said, not from Solomon, but from Solomon's son, brother, Nathan. And, uh, there was a second prophet, I said this, uh, there was a second prophet serving the Lord in the days of King David by the name of Gad. Um, and so, and this is the reason why it's important for me to tell you that is because the books of First and Second Samuel, the author, uh, you know, they're 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 First and Second Samuel are titled First and Second Samuel, after the prophet Samuel. But Samuel couldn't have written Second Samuel because he's dead. Nathan and Gad, I think, um, uh, uh, First Chronicles in chapter twenty nine tells us that Nathan and Gad are the ones who wrote. The remainder of First and Second Samuel and finished out the life of King David and that that chronicle of the life of King David. Um, so I've got a little bit of a tongue twister here. What God would have? So we're talking about Lord. What wilt thou have me to do? What God would have Nathan to do was to tell David what that God would have David to do. Does that mean what God had Nathan do was to tell David? what he would do, what God wanted him to do. I believe the ministry of the Old Testament prophets, so we're talking about what's going on is there's a transition from God speaking directly to um, a, a, an important Bible character, speaking directly to him to tell him what to do, to now God is using a prophet to communicate to God's man what God would have him to do. Um, in a sense, God did that even with the Apostle Paul through Ananias. I said, go to the city. You're going to meet a man by the name of Ananias, and he's going to tell you, you know, what to do. And uh, so, in a sense, God even does that with the Apostle Paul. There's going to be, you know, uh, God speaks directly to Solomon, and we'll see that, uh, the Lord willing, that'll probably be next week that we'll see that. But I think there is a shift that is taking place in this passage of Scripture, where rather than God speaking directly to these key characters in the Word of God, he begins speaking through the prophets. And, and I believe it's significant because I believe the, the ministry, the Old Testament prophet, um, is the precursor to the New Testament preacher. Not uh, the, the, um, the, the, the ministry today, the ministry of the pastor, the ministry of the preacher today isn't uh, based off of the priesthood. The, the Levitical priesthood, you should consider yourself a priest to the Lord. You are the priests of God today. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been made priests and kings uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, and, and, and so what we would do as believers, we would look through the Old Testament priesthood ministry and we would find uh, clues in, uh, uh, to help us in our current ministry as Christians, as believers in this world. But I think if you're going to look for directions or something that kind of is similar to what um, a, a, a New Testament pastor is or a New Testament uh, preacher is today, you'd be looking at the prophets for that. There are, some things in a, there are some things that the Bible doesn't really tell us how 
things got like they are. For instance, uh, by the time Jesus is alive and an adult, um, the, um, uh, the practice of synagogue had become just regular Jewish worship. It was, it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue. It was, uh, and there were synagogues in almost every city, not every one. I think what the way the standard was in those days, in order for a city to have a synagogue, there needed to be um, 10 adult males, Jewish males in a city, in order for that city to warrant a synagogue of its own. And, uh, but uh, in every city that did have a synagogue, or every city that did have that 10, that number of, of Jewish males, mature uh, Jews, uh, there was a synagogue. And we do know that it was the manner of the Lord Jesus Christ to go to the synagogue. It's also the manner of the Apostle Paul. Now, how in the world it ever switched to where instead of going to the temple uh, three times a year, they were still doing that in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're still doing that. But now they've added to this thing the synagogue. How in the world that came to, came to be the Bible doesn't tell us. Now, we, we do know historically how it happened. It, when the Jews went off into Babylonian captivity and then the, uh, the, um, the, the, the Israelite, the, the ones of the Israelite, they went off into Assyrian captivity and they went into what is called the diaspora. They're, di they're, they're dispersed around the world in those days. There's no way for them to get back to Jerusalem. So they're Jews. They want to somehow maintain their Jewish tradition and their Jewish culture and distinctions and so forth. And so they began this tradition, this idea of gathering together in small groups that they called synagogues to, uh, to continue to worship the Lord even though they couldn't go back to the temple. And by the time Jesus is around, that is such an established practice that Jesus doesn't question it. He goes to the temple. He begins his ministry in the temple saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And uh, how that happened, we don't really know. And the same thing, I'm not saying that the prophet is, you know, God says, okay, now, New Testament pastor, um, the prophet, uh, there's the priesthood, and then there are these prophets, and these prophets are going to somehow morph into pastors. But it does seem to me, when I look at it, the priests, the priests served mostly in the temple, and, um, you know, they were scattered around the country when they were off duty, but, um, but when they were serving the Lord, when a priest was ministering, they were ministering in Jerusalem at the temple. That's what they did. Uh, but the prophets, they seemed to be scattered around pretty much everywhere, and there were prophets who, would, uh, who had ministries in this town, that town, and the other, and so forth, in both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom as well. And, and so... Uh, I, as, because I see the, the, the Old Testament prophets as being kind of the precursors to New Testament preaching, the New Testament preaching ministry, um, I see in Nathan's ministry with King David a type of New Testament ministry. In fact, what I'm going to show you today, you, I, I think you can almost build a philosophy in ministry off of the interactions between Nathan and David. I was thinking... Um, and I didn't, I, I, I thought about bringing and forgot it. Um, I was going to bring out our church's constitution and bylaws. The opening statement of our constitution and bylaws is a purpose statement. This church, Bible Baptist Church, Puyallup, Washington, exists for this purpose. And you could almost build your purpose statement off of Nathan's work with David, what God has Nathan do. With David. There are four specific instances where we can see God telling Nathan to go tell David to do this. All right? Four specific ones. And there are some other conversations, by the way, but these but these are the these four are ones where God tells Nathan, speaks to Nathan, and says, You go tell David X. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. The first one is has to do with the building of the temple. So we're in, in, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 7. We're going to start in verse number 4 this time, and I'm going to read down to verse number 13. It says, And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in, whereas I've not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle? In all the places wherein I've walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word in, with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build you not me a house, a cedar? Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
I took thee from the sheep coat and from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over, uh, over my people over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt uh, sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall, build, uh, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house from my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever." I think, see three keys to this passage. Nathan, you go, go tell David this. David has said, uh, you know, it's just God has put it in my heart to build a temple for him to be in. And Nathan says, yeah, that's a good idea. And Nathan goes home, you know, and, uh, and that night, now, you know, Nathan, he's just talking out of you because anyone would say it's a good idea. Let's do something for God. That's a good idea. Good ideas aren't necessarily from God ideas. There's a difference between a good idea and a from God idea. And uh, David's got a good idea, and Nathan says, that's a good idea. But when he goes home that night, God begins to speak to Nathan and says, no, that's not what I want. In fact, I want you to go and tell my servant David this. This is what I want to do, and this is what I'm going to do. And so I see three keys in this, uh, in this passage. First of all, I see that David has a heart for the house of God, but he's not in charge. He's got a heart for the house of God, but, but David isn't in charge of this thing. God, it, God wants everyone to remember. God wants even a great man like David to remember that God is in charge. No one man is in charge of the things of God. Uh, God is in charge. That's a good thing to have a heart for the house of God. But it is another thing to take charge of the house of God. To say, I have such a burden, such a heart for the things of God, that this is what I'm going to do. There, it's entirely the wrong attitude there. So go ahead, read verses 4 and 5 again. It came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord. And boy, we all ought to be listening for that. We ought to be listening not just for what's in my heart and what I would like to do and what I think I see and the things that seem to matter to me. You know, this is, you know, I'm kind of this, I'm driven this way and I'm motivated toward that. And those, rather than wait, you know, the thing that I'm motivated for and the thing that matters to me and where I've got my burden, what all of us ought to be doing is we ought to be listening for God to say, thus saith the Lord, and how God is going to speak to us. Thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? You know, there's probably... One of the biggest challenges I think we have be in, you know, in, as Christians, be, you know, that struggle, that wrestle between the flesh and the spirit, because on the one hand, we need to take ownership in the house of God. Um, the church that God puts us in and that we belong to, there needs to be some ownership. Okay, this we're Bible Baptist Church, Puyallup, right now. And those of you that are members of Bible Baptist Church in Puyallup, I want you to feel a sense of ownership. I mean, this place belongs to you. If there's something that's not cleaned up, uh, rather than looking for someone else to clean it up, clean it up, because it belongs to you. If there's something that needs to be fixed, rather than saying, Pastor, hire someone to fix it, go fix it, um, uh, because this place belongs to you. If there's something you feel like needs to be done, um, rather than, uh, you know, just complaining that it's not being done, uh, then get it done, because, uh, you know, this place belongs to you. Take some ownership in this place. It's vital to the care not only of the property of the, of the, the building property but also the care of the members of the church and, and our outreach, our church outreach. It is vital that every one of us would take ownership in the church and we can't take the attitude that it's someone else's responsibility to do the work of the ministry. This is our church. This is our house. This is where God has placed us and it is our responsibility to do the work of the ministry, to take care of the property it's our responsibility to minister to one another. It's our responsibility to reach out to the people in our neighborhoods and invite them to come in and to try to win them to the Lord and see them baptized and see them being faithful to church so they can grow in the Lord. It is our responsibility. And one of the things that we need 
to do is we need to train ourselves and teach ourselves. You need to hear from the pulpit. Thus saith the Lord, take some ownership here. I mean, uh, consider your, that you're responsible for this place and go do the things that need to be done. Rather than complaining about what isn't done, get it done. Take ownership of your church and then let go. Because it is our church, and we belong to it, and it belongs to us. But it's also God's church. And we have no right to lay our grubby little paws on it. Huh? You love it? You serve in it? You take ownership in it? But never forget, this is God's house. Whatever you do here, you do under the help of the Lord, the guidance of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. You give all the glory to the Lord. And when the Lord says, let go, let go. You own this place and you own none of this place. You're responsible for this place, but God can do it without you. While you're here, alive, he's probably not going to do it. Probably going to tell you to do it. But if you won't do it, God can kill you and get someone else who will do it. And he's got every, and he would be glorified in doing that. And it's his business. It's his place. Have a heart for it but then let go of it, okay? Number so, so David has a heart for the house of God, but, um, but he is supposed to remember that this place is God's house, not his house, all right? Now, the second thing that I notice in this passage is that uh, it's God's business to appoint a place. So David, now, this whole thing, David said, well, God, you know, they've got the tabernacle, and the tabernacle hasn't been used for years. It's up there in Shiloh, and the ark hasn't been there. It's in another place, and so he's going to have to go get the ark, and he's going to have to bring it. To Jerusalem, and then he's gonna. And what he does is, and it's interesting. I think this is an interesting thing. He leaves the, the tabernacle that Moses constructed in Shiloh. He sends, the, brings the ark to Jerusalem, and he builds a new tent for it. Rather than going and getting the ark, or the, the the tabernacle that is in Shiloh, and bringing it to the place that of uh, Jerusalem, and putting the ark there, or rather than taking the ark and taking it back to Shiloh where the tabernacle is. He leaves the tabernacle in Shiloh. He brings the ark to Jerusalem, and he builds a new, a new tent to put, the tabern and to put the ark in at that time. So God tells him in this passage of Scripture, I want you to remember this, David. It's not your place to pick a place for God's people to worship God. Look at verse number 10. Moreover, I, this is God through Nathan. God is speaking to King David. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. So there's this whole monologue that's going on uh, in this passage where God schools David on the difference between a building and a body. Um, verses 6 through 9, whereas I've not dwelt in any house since the time uh, that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle, all the places wherein I've walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a, a word with any of the tribes of the nation whom I commanded to feed my people, saying, why build you not me in house? And it goes on from there. It's the whole thing God talking about the difference between a building and a body. David, did you... What, has there ever been a time it's in the history of Israel, has there ever been a time where I've said, I can't, you know, people can't worship me unless they got a building? Have I ever asked for a building? And so the difference between a body, uh, between a building and a body. God was perfectly capable of doing his work without some fancy building. He didn't, it didn't matter what David thought God did or did not need. God knew what his people needed and how did God knew, knew what his people needed so that they could be planted and that they could grow spiritually. God was saying, David, I know what you're thinking. You know, you're thinking it's got to be fancy. And you're thinking you've got to do all these wonderful things. And he's going to say it's got to be magnificult. 
and uh, all that kind of, I know what you think, but I want you to understand, I've never needed a building before, and I don't need one now, and, um, and you don't need, so, so you take your hands off of this thing, and let me be God in the difference between a body and a building. Uh, uh, so we always, we always like to say um, that a church is, the, is not the building, it's the believers. Right? We like to say that. Um, a lot of people, especially people who don't believe in local church, you know, have you ever met those people? Well, I'm religious. I don't believe in organized religion. I believe in God. I just don't believe in organized religion. Most, those people like to say, well, the church is the believers and it's not the building. You don't need a building to, uh, to worship God in. And very, very frequently someone will say, well, my favorite place to worship God is by the lake or by the mountains. And my favorite place to worship God is, you know, and they'll, they'll talk about some kind of nature type of scene. You know, I like to get alone with God and, in nature and that kind of a thing. And uh, so here's the thing. Um, God doesn't need a building, but he always does pick a place. Always. He picks a place. Always does. A church can meet in a schoolhouse, a clubhouse, a member's house, or under a tree. But it'll have a place does meet. Churches meet. Churches are a group of people who meet together. Church must have a place to grow roots if the members are to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Psalm 1 and verse 3. It's got to be a place to grow some roots. It's got to be something that's organized and something regular about it. We, we do this thing on a regular basis, and that's how we are established, and that's how we grow, and that's how we come to a place where we can be protected from the evil one, and we, can, we won't be afflicted by the enemy because we have grown some spiritual roots. We do this thing on, you know, on a regular basis. We know when we're going to meet, where we're going to meet, and with whom we will meet, and we get together with God together, and it's how we get built up in our most holy faith from my Sunday school lesson this morning. The, house of, the number three, the house of God is, we're still number three, point one. This is actually point one, letter C. Trying to get you through the first point. We've got four points in this message. This one's the longest one, by the way. So the third thing I noticed in this, this passage in Nathan's instructions, Nathan, this is what I would have you to do. I want you to go tell David what I would have him to do. And so this is the third element in that instruction there, that the house of God, that I, I see that the house of God is, is to be intimately connected to the Son of God, who we know to be Jesus. Look at verses, uh, 2 Samuel 7, verses 12, 13, 12 and 13. When, the days shall be, when thy days shall be fulfilled, in other words, you die, David, when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of my bowels. That sounds like Solomon. We'll see him a little bit more in just a few minutes. It sounds like Solomon. I'm going to take one of your children. He's going to proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So when you're dead, David, I'm going to give your kingdom to one of your seed, and he shall build in a house for my name. That sounds like Solomon. I will establish, and then it says this, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That doesn't sound like Solomon. There is a connection between um, that house of God that David's heart is to build and that Solomon is going to be um, a commission to build and to the Son of God who said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Talk about himself. There's a connection between the house of God and the Son of God. I want you to always remember that there is a connection between the house of God. That was a temple in the Old Testament. The New Testament is the church. There is a connection between the house of God and the Son of God, who is the head of his church, and this is his body. This isn't this. A church can meet in the clubhouse, but it isn't a club. It can meet in a schoolhouse, but it isn't a class. This is the house of God, and we are assembled here today under 
the authority of the Son of God. The promise God made to David could not possibly have been fulfilled in Solomon. This is a promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let us remember that every local church, this local church is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it rests, this church rests not on the pastor and not on the deacons and not on any great member of the church. This church does not survive because the pastor is who he is or because the deacons are in charge of it or because there are certain members of the church who are the pillars of the community and the pillars of the church. We do have some pillars. There are some members of this church that in my flesh I think, I don't know what we'll do with if they, if, when they pass, if they pass. There are some people that I just don't think should pass. Just so you know, I, there are a few of you, I don't think it's the will of God for you to ever die. At least not before I die. I mean, just know, I'm just telling you, you will be in absolute rebellion if you die before me. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. But I can think that all I want to, but the truth of the matter is this church, the head of this church is the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. If we, and, and so we've got to be real careful that we don't get ourselves too focused on one pillar or another. Because here's the thing about people. All people are sinners. And all people will fail the church eventually. If your faith hasn't found a resting place in Jesus Christ, you're building your life on shifting sand. Your faith can't be in any one person or any... Your faith really can't be on any group of persons in the church. It needs to be the Lord Jesus Christ. This is His place. You say, yeah, but there are some people in the church that are really wonderful or there's some people in the church who are really not wonderful. But that doesn't matter. Neither of those matter. What matters is... Jesus put this church together. And if your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can trust that Jesus Christ is going to use this church to do in your life what the church is supposed to do in your life, and he'll use this church to help you to do what you are supposed to do, which is offer worship to him. So the first thing, Nathan, I want you to go tell David. What I would have you to do, Nathan, is to go to David and tell him these things concerning the building of the house of God. Number two, Nathan found himself um, reproving King David's sin. So we're going to be in uh, chapter number 12, 2 Samuel chapter number 12, verses 1 through 14. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, uh, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought up and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man. He spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come into him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold. I don't know if he's probably going to restore the fourth lamb fourfold before he dies. I would assume that's going to be. And he shall restore the lamb. That was supposed to be a little bit of a joke right there, but it didn't work very well, so we're just going. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee to thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. And I gave thee the house of Israel and of, thy, and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover had given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife. Has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart out from thy house because thou hast despised me and hast taken that wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord hath also put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the 
the text, you know, most of us are probably very familiar with David's sin with Bathsheba and the, the murder of Uriah and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I'll leave all of that one. I just want to say this, that a very clear duty in the work of the Lord and the ministry of Christ is rebuke and correction. Um, if it is God is going to use a man of God to help us to know God's will in our life for our lives concerning the house of the Lord, concerning our life in this world and our ministry for the Lord, he's also going to use the man of God to bring correction and rebuke in our life. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one through three, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap together, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now I dislike being negative. I, I do. I dislike being negative. I can remember this. This was uh, when I first started pastoring in Astoria. We just started church. We're still meeting in the little abandoned gas station building, and in that little gas station building, we had a um, like a Franklin stove fireplace, not a not an airtight stove. It was actually given to. I found someone who would just give it to me. It was a I mean, just an old, uh, upright, standing, wood-burning stove, and it was, um, you know, very inefficient. But it was the, uh, it was cheaper than natural gas was, and those things. And so I, I would, that's how I would heat the building for services. And I have to go up in the woods and get the, get wood, uh, firewood for this thing, this this monstrous thing. One time, Rod Hockley and I went up into the woods together and to get wood and in, in my my truck and uh, my little truck. Then, well, I think. Maybe my truck now still has a short bed, but my, my, my pickup that I had in Astoria had a little short bed in it, and uh, in the back of it I had a, uh, I had a, a toolbox, one of those toolbox Anita gave it to me. It was actually a first gift that Anita gave me. I said, i got to stop telling stories like that because it's going to take too long. Uh, but I had all these things in it that I couldn't get a lot of firewood. So you go up in the woods, and the, if you're, the bed of your truck is full of all kinds of other stuff, and you're going to get firewood, I wanted to get as much room for firewood that I could. Um, so I took out a spare tire. flat tire in the woods. Some of you don't know Rod Hockley. He's passed now, but Rod wasn't the kind of person who could walk out of the mountains. So I did. I walked out of the mountains, and I don't remember how many miles I had to go walk out of the mountains until I came to the first house that would let me use their telephone. And so um, I went to knock on the door, got the telephone, and I gave Miss. We didn't have a telephone at the time, Anita and I didn't have it, so I called Mrs. Hockley, who went to get Anita to tell her that she needed to come into the woods to get me, and Brother Hockley to get and bring the tire, the, the spare tire with her. And so that meant after I made the call, I'm sitting out along this logging road, you know, waiting for Anita to show up, and it's not going to happen right away. She's got to go to the Hock, the Mrs. Hockley's got to go get uh, Mrs. McKenzie, and they got to go back to the Hockley's house to get my tire, the tire to put it in the car so Anita can come and get me. So it's going to take some time, and I'm sitting there, and I can remember this thinking, I, I was, it's Saturday. Praise the Lord, I already had my messages ready. But I'm sitting there alongside the road thinking, that message I'm going to preach tomorrow morning, it's mean. I get so tired of being mean. And I just sat there and I started thinking about ways, how, Lord, could I say the same thing and not be mean? I don't like being negative. And frankly, I'll be honest with you, I find, especially today, people I think, don't like me being negative <laughs> anymore. I think it used to be people thought preachers were supposed to be negative, but I we've become a very soft people. We are a very soft people today, and we don't. The whole concept of being corrected is kind of opposed to us. Christianity is just supposed to make us feel good. I go to church to feel good. I want to feel better about myself when I leave than I felt when I got there. Well, if that's how you want it, it it'll happen if you come to the altar and get rid of your sin but you're not going to get rid of your sin until I tell you about it. And so, um, but it, it is clearly a part of the ministry that Christ gives to the, to the work of the Lord is to correct. There's supposed to be some correction, some rebuke, reprove, rebuke, exhort. With all long suffering, it means you just keep doing it. Teach them from the Word of God, show them, up, show them it, where it's at in the Bible, and just keep showing them again and again and again and again. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. 
Just keep doing it again and again and again. That is part of the word of the Lord. Nathan, number three, got to move on here, was involved in training Solomon. So I'm going to read, this is uh, 2 Samuel 12, verses 24 through 25. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now I'm going to admit that this is a little bit more challenging to see, but here's what I get from this, from reading the commentaries and the students of the Bible from past generations and hundreds years ago and so forth, that what happened in this passage of Scripture, David called, Dan Bathsheba called him Solomon, and the preacher comes over and says, I'm going to call him Jedidiah, my own name for him, because God, God told me God loves him, and I'm going to call him Jedidiah because the Lord, because the Lord told me to. And what I see in this is that <clears throat> Nathan became involved, this is what they, the the Scholars say that Nathan became involved in training Solomon to do what God was calling Solomon to do. You remember David had multiple wives, and the culture back then was different than it is now and so forth. He's got lots of wives, and he's got lots of children, and it's not like David's you know, personally involved in his kids' lives. He's got too many kids. And in fact, it wasn't even the culture in those days for him to be involved uh, in kids' lives. Parents would turn, especially parents who were wealthy or you know, wanted the best for their children, what they would do is they would turn them over to teachers. And so, for instance, uh, the apostle um, Paul, uh, he was brought up at the feet of a teacher uh, by the name of Gamaliel. Saul of Tarsus, who became the apostle Paul, was brought up by somebody else, was raised by somebody else, a teacher who trained him up to be a Pharisee. Uh, the implication is that Solomon was brought up at the feet of Nathaniel the prophet. I'm sorry, of Nathan the prophet. That Nathan took charge because of what God wanted to do with Solomon, because of the role that Solomon was going to play in the plan of God, that God placed Nathan, uh, placed Solomon in the charge of Nathan to raise him up. So David names him Solomon, but Nathan says, I'm going to call him Jedidiah. I wonder how many of you, I mean, I know there are people in church who get mad if I misspell your name. What if I went up to you? In fact, I did this one time. Now that I say it, I can remember this. What if I got up and said, you know what? I just don't think your children are named God. I'm going to start calling you, your kids this. Went up to a guy one time, a kid one time, and I said, hey, buddy, how you doing? And he said, his name's not Buddy. That's our dog. <laughs> well, fine. You learn how to memorize all of these kids' names. I can't even remember my two boys' names. So anyway, but just get off that thing. Nathan said, I know you named him Solomon. I'm going to call him Jedediah because the Lord loves him and the Lord's got a plan for him. So I'm going to, and I'm going to train him. I'm going to educate him anyway. And so, um, yeah, you ever wonder how Solomon, uh, you know, when David, you know, now he becomes a man and David says to Solomon, here's what, I put all these things together. I want you to build a tabernacle, a temple, and here's the instructions. Here's all the people. Here's all the, the, the resources I've got and so forth. And why Solomon didn't say, uh, I think I'm just going to do my own thing. Because he had been raised all his life. He'd been brought up at the feet of Nathan the prophet to do what his dad said and build this temple. Um, First Kings chapter number one, when Solomon becomes king, I'm not going to read it right now, but remember when Solomon becomes king, Nathan the prophet is very much involved in the inauguration, the coronation of, of Solomon to be king. He's involved in rebuking David for his relationship with Bathsheba, and then he's involved in raising the child that David and Bathsheba, the first child dies, and the, ch the child that David and Bathsheba uh, produce, Solomon. So, and just, just so, a huge piece of the ministry of the local church is assisting parents to raise their children in nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's part of our, our responsibility, part of our role as a local church is to help the people of the church to raise their children for the Lord. Number four, Nathan, uh, Nathan uh, saw himself finally in, um, involved in helping David in the ordering of the services. In verse, and I will admit that this one, this, and this is the only one of the four, four where God doesn't, where I can't find that God says, Nathan, go tell David, here's how I want you to do church. 
But look at verse, second, this is Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25. It says, And he set the Levites in the house, David, he set the Levites in the house, Lord, with cymbals, with psalteries, with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan, the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. So God commanded David to order, organize the services in the tabernacle, gave him that commandment by the prophets, Nathan and Gad. So the Mosaic order for the priesthood was set up in a kind of a nomadic arrangement where the tabernacle was moved on a regular basis. So you got all these people who are Levites in the tribe of, uh, of Levite. And they're all given a, a, a responsibility in the, with the tabernacle, and some of them were to carry the, the curtains, the walls, and some of them were to carry the ark, and some of them were to uh, carry the, uh, the, the furniture in the courtyard. And, you know, some of them, when it was all set up, it was their job to, to bake the bread and make sure there, there was fresh bread in the, in the house of the Lord in the tabernacle, and some of them to make sure that the lantern had oil and that it was lit and all those kind of things. But now, all of a sudden, their things have changed because because now they're not in a tabernacle, a tent, and it's not being moved all the time. They've moved the, the Ark of the Lord, and they've moved the center of worship to Jerusalem and to a temple is what they're going to do. And so there's no longer any need for these guys whose their job is to roll up the, 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 the curtains of the, t of the tent and carry them around, and their job is to uh, pack up the, you know, the silverware and, um, and, and pack it around, and their job is to you know, carry the Ark of the Covenant and pack it around because no one's going to be doing that anymore. And so what are these guys going to do? They say, well, my job, I'm retired, I guess. You know, my whole family for forever is retired. You know, so no, that isn't what God did is he gave them new assignments. And David gave them the assignments, but David was commanded what to assign them to by the prophets is what the word of God says. And so they needed new responsibilities. It was David, Gad, and Nathan who organized their new assignments. Now, that reminds me of Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 12, where the Bible says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God puts some of his children to work. God puts some of his children to work, putting the rest of his children to work. That's what he does. He puts some of his children to work, putting the rest of his children to work. So conclusion, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Well, if Nathan were here today, God would tell him to tell us, love God's house and remember it's God's house. Humble yourselves and accept reproof when it needs to, when God chooses to give it. Train up your children in the ways they should go and allow the church that God places you in to help you do it. Pick up the tools that God gives you in the house of God and put them to work where God places you. So from David to the end of the book of the Revelation, the focus, is, the focus of God's word is the house of God. If you're a child of God, if you're saved, let your focus be and my 